Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Braggs, I appreciate it. Good to see you, Mark. Uh, this is the this is the digital handshake that started in what? I was trying to think back. We probably met at camp in 2019. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We, we took a we took a group photo with a bunch of Bears Twitter oh, yeah. elites, the the best of the <laughs> best. And uh, was I was back. not elite at that point. Yeah. Let's but let's be honest. We don't have to make stuff up. The back in our our back in my training camp glory days, where I was still allowed to do video at at practice. So you know, um, mm. you know, so we're excited to bring you on and, and get your knowledge now that you've reached uh, into your empire that you're building. You know, with Brett Coleman, you guys are doing a fantastic job with bootleg football. And any of you that aren't subscribed to that YouTube channel, you absolutely should. A ton of knowledge. Uh, great. You guys do an absolutely fantastic job. I think that goes without saying. Uh, but, you know, I want to bring you on here today because, you know, you're dialed into this draft process. We're 31 days away from the NFL draft. Maybe the most anticipated draft in Chicago Bears history and you do such a great job of just covering the national landscape for all teams, but obviously you're a Bears fan as well, and that's where your roots are. Um, so you've been to the Shrine Bowl, you've been to the Combine, you've been to a handful of pro days, you'll be getting ready to go to the Washington Pro, ba pro Day here later in the week. But let's just start with the golden goose that is Caleb Williams. Uh, you know, Mark always calls it, what do you say, P P B S D P T B S D. How does it go, Mark? I I coin e EJ. By the way, uh, thank you for letting me get a word in here, Braggs. I appreciate it, EJ. <laughs> um, your stuff's great. Thank you for taking time to be on CHGO Bears After Dark. I appreciate it as well. Uh, excited for this conversation because I spent about three hours of my day listening to your work, and it's uh, incredibly thorough. God, you guys, you guys, in the history of two dudes who love football. You two really <laughs> love football. Um, I mean, it, it is at an upper, upper level. But, yeah, I called it, uh, it post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which is a very serious thing. But mm -hmm. post-bear traumatic disorder, PBTD, yeah. not as serious and obviously joking. Uh, but I do think that has happened to, that happened to Justin Fields. It happened to Mitch Trubisky. It's happened to a lot of quarterbacks, which is why – uh, Ryan Poles has been so aggressive this offseason in making this and last offseason and making this a landing spot uh, that is a lot more comfortable, uh, which, you know, I, I I think he's done a great job. And you guys teed up some, you know, you're, you're both huge fans of Roma Dunze. We could get to that a little bit later. But uh, everything that's coming out about Caleb is Caleb is great. Caleb is this. Caleb is that. And I don't think you're not going to say anything different, are you? I'm not. And that has I didn't start there. I start, I try and start with a neutral slate on, on every prospect. I don't, one of the things that surprises people is I don't watch a ton of college football as it happens because it's actually less helpful to me. Um, I'm going to be watching all those games uh, multiple times, but I'm going to be focusing on specific players. And a lot of times uh, I, I know you guys watch college football. You get distracted by the narratives because they're not necessarily true. Um, broadcast teams a lot of times come in with a story and they want to tell it whether it's true or not. And they will, they will find any particular piece they can to support that. And that's actually distracting from what's really going on. And so when you're watching all 22 and there's no audio, um, that's what I'm really interested in because I don't really care if they're good college players. I care if they're good pro players and that's a completely different thing. So as I come to these players, I try and stay as neutral as I can. Obviously, I see some college games. Obviously, there's lots of talk about who's doing well and who's not doing well. I try and keep that pretty limited until I literally sit down and start picking apart their games. And I did the same with Caleb. Um, certainly don't have a chance to speak to people around many of these players as much as I have around Caleb. And that's just probably lucky, I guess. Um, but every single time, I've talked to somebody and they've had a chance to even just be like not gushing about him. It hasn't happened every single time the person goes to the wall and says, this is a great kid. This is a great leader. This is somebody that loves football. He's an awesome teammate. He's got zero ego. He is a hard worker. He has been since he got here. This is not a Johnny come lately thing. The moment he got here, this be here being USC from Oklahoma, it was like this the very first day. And he's been the same dude every single day. And 
everybody says that, whether it's his quarterback trainers, we sat with his offensive line during the pro day and, you know, offensive linemen are going to say what they're going to say. They're, they're not going to, they're not going to couch it if they don't like the guy, every single one of those guys. And these are all the returners for USC next year would take a bullet for that guy. Like they all love him up and down the board. And after months and months of that, yeah, I am fully on board with, look, this guy has everything he needs from a football standpoint, from an off the field standpoint, between the ears, everything else is up to the football gods. There is nothing he is short of that says he's not going to work out. If he doesn't work out as many other quarterbacks before him haven't, it's not because he was lacking anything. It's because of situation or, or whatever else, but he's got all the tools. So, yeah, I mean, cause that's what we were talking about a little bit before we got on air was my kryptonite is training camp. I it's, you know, <laughs> hopes, hope springs eternal when I get to training camp and I always want to see the best in every player that runs out there and see their pathway to greatness as a Chicago bear. And I've already told myself probably a million times as we get closer to training camp over the summer, like relax, you know, I I'm going to be the complete hype machine that I am every year, but you're saying you're green lighting me to yep. go full hype here. <laughs> I'm training camp in August. A hundred percent. And I, you know, I think we should, we talked a little bit before the show, Greg, about bears, Twitter and what it's been. Um, Everybody knows how divided that's been and how how toxic that's been. You know, that's not my favorite part of sports. And I think it should be okay. <laughs> like you talked about green lighting somebody. I'm not here to green light anybody's fandom. <laughs> Fan however you want. But I think it should be okay for people that want to get excited when a very good football player, I don't like the term generational, I'm not going to use it. When a very good football player comes to your football team, however you happen to acquire that. Bears got extremely lucky. They got Carolina's pick, and Carolina happened to be the worst team in the league. So they ended up with the top pick for the second year in a row. Almost never happens. Just don't look that gift horse in the mouth. Like, don't take that good fortune for granted. Be excited that you had the chance to choose one of, if not the very best football player in this draft, and that he has a chance to lead your team. Like, get excited about that. We should be excited about that. Sure, lots of things can happen to knock us off that track, but don't not be excited because they might happen. That's just like kicking your own legs out. That's that's silly. So the, the one thing real quick, Carm, because one thing that came out from you guys when you were doing your defensive player breakdown here in one of your most recent vi videos on bootleg football, where you and Brett kind of had this discussion about a wide receiver pulling his hamstring the 20 minutes yeah. before you know the session is going to start, something that Caleb and USC had been practicing for, and his team had been game planning for, for a month, maybe longer. And mm -hmm. now all of a sudden there's an audible called right before, and he took it right in stride. And you guys reported that. And, and I, I didn't really hear that from anyone else. And, and I, I think that kind of got lost in the shuffle from the hype that was that day. Uh, so maybe talk a little bit about that for those that don't know the story and, and how Caleb kind of took that in stride. Because when I heard the story, I was very encouraged by what I heard. Sure. It, it didn't come out and it didn't come out on purpose. It would have been very easy to stand in front of the assembled throng of reporters, including Nick and Adam from your team that were there and, and everybody else Biggs was there. And uh, you know, Sam farmer was there cause he's in LA and like, you know what those scrums are like. He very easily could have said, well, you know, we had a hiccup and, I had to adjust and whatever. He didn't say a single thing about it. The reason that we found out about it was it was reported later, but uh, Brett also ended up getting an invitation to go out with the guys that he's training with, the team that's training Caleb. Most draft-eligible players will go to a training facility. Quarterbacks have specific ones, but just about every player of all positions will go to Exos or Athletes First or wherever and, and train to get ready for both the combine and then – for the draft. And so uh, his trainers were staying not far away from where Brett lives. And they said, Hey, you know, we, we got your message today. You want to come out and, you know, have, have a drink, have some dinner. And so they ended up talking for like two and a half hours. And that's when Brett found out 
and sent that to me and posted the tweet that most people saw. So it does happen. These things are highly scripted. They are at every pro day. This is not a Caleb specific thing. Bo Nix's was the same the week before at Oregon. And I, I am absolutely sure Penix's is going to be the same at Washington on Thursday. Like this is what it's for. We've all seen these on NFL network. You know, it's 75 to a hundred throws short to warm up, get timing going medium to long work with different receivers who are also eligible. It's a chance to showcase them as well, but it really is about the quarterback. Like everything kind of stops and it's all about the quarterback. And because everybody's watching and it's a sort of high glare moment, they do. They script it and they practice it. This receiver runs this route. This receiver is going to run this route and they go through. It's like a play or a TV show or anything else. There's a script and they follow it. Well, guy pulled up during the 40. He pulled his hamstring like right at the end. Wasn't terrible. He'll probably be fine. But like he's a no go for the rest of the day. And he had one out of every five or six catches in that rotation. So you start off with this number and now, okay, are we going to give those catches to other guys who haven't been practicing those routes or, you know, what are we going to do? And all that adjustment has to happen right now. You're done running the 40 and throwing session is pretty quickly after that. And the thing that was encouraging, hopefully to you and to me as well, was the way he handled that, which is like, Hey man, that's cool. Not, Oh hell, why does this have to happen to me now? Right. Like he was like, Nope. I'm good. I got it. This is what we're going to do. And he said to them, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to move these throws. These guys are going to take these up. We're going to shorten it by a few throws. We're good to go. Like, don't, don't worry about it. And everybody was like, oh, okay. If you're not worried about it, we're not worried about it. It's your day. Um, and they just ran it. And again, from the outside, you wouldn't have known. It was a little slower than a few other throwing sessions and there were more breaks uh, I would say a few less throws overall. Again, we found out later because they trimmed them, but that was the only sort of outward inkling that anything had changed was they would throw three or four routes, stop for water, kind of huddle up, go back, throw three or four routes. Other guys like to get into a lather bow Nix. They probably had him doing 15, 20 throws at a pop really to keep him going and, and get him moving. But that's again, his choice. He wants to showcase that he could do that. So it was pretty cool that that you know, it's not cool that the guy pulled his hamstring, but it's really cool that, you know, in in reaction to that, in what is a very pressure filled moment, Caleb couldn't have been smoother, or more relaxed about it. So that was cool. Well, and when you you factor in, how's my microphone, by the way? Is it better? It's good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. But thank you. I needed to double check that in real time. <laughs> All right. So, look, when you factor in that reporting with the way his demeanor of the day for us sitting um you know, back in the studios, just watching the whole thing. I mean, he was calm. He was cool. He he was in control, not bothered, which is also, you know, flows with everything else that's being said. Um, the one thing, and I, I'd love to move off Caleb because there's a million things we can cover here, but I just do want to underline the one thing that I, I have heard that excited me the most is because everyone's worried, well, he, he tries to hit the home run ball. He holds it too long. Mm. And, and what what the other what's what I've heard recently is that he actually loves to play on time. He's excellent on time. That's where he's most comfortable. Which is kind of what he said to Coward. Like I like to throw the ball. Like I don't want to be running around. Mm -hmm. So the Bears are you know when you go out and you get Keenan Allen, that is an on time receiver. DJ Moore is an on time receiver. Who they have a lot of options of where they can go in the draft. But it's like they're they are for a guy who's super talented who can play off script. They are trying to give him I guess a lot of layups which I don't know here, EJ, how high you're willing to go, but I keep on throwing. He could beat Andrew Luck's rookie record 4,200-plus yards in a season. I wouldn't completely rule it out. 17-game season, that's a little cheating, but you factor all of it in with who's there. New NFL, decade later, I wouldn't rule it out that he could pass it. No, it is possible, and I would say that's, you know – I don't want to say ceiling like hard cap, but I would say that's near the upper limit. That would be a very successful season. The most successful throwing season for a Bears quarterback ever as a rookie would be a thing. It is absolutely possible. I'm glad you brought up the on time thing. There was a, let's just call it a tornado of circumstance this year that really made it so a lot of people sort of have an overblown notion that the only plays he makes are the big ones off script because those show up on the highlights. That's one thing. If you're not a USC fan, you didn't watch them get blown out a lot this year, then you wouldn't have seen the rest of it. But it was also this entire season. 
the USC team was not good. If you look at the number of points that they gave up in his losses, it's in the 40s. Like he was having to try and hit all those home runs to keep up. It obviously didn't work out. The offense was pretty horrible. Like I'm not saying the offensive players are horrible. I like a lot of the players they had on offense, but some of the calls were mm, <laughs> mind numbing. Uh, it was it was tough to watch. So, but if you go through his tape, and again, I've gone through last year's tape, didn't know what was going to happen last year, and I've gone through this year's tape as well. Last year's tape is very different than this year's tape, and there is a lot more on time in last year's tape, but there is a lot of on time in this year's tape, and nobody wants to look at it. So every time I went through a game from this year, I specifically, because I knew that this was going to be a, a point of conversation as we get to Caleb in the draft, is to write down on schedule, on time, right? When he makes what I'll call very basic throws that you can build an NFL offense on. Slants, outs, stops, back shoulders, hooks, little, little posts. I'm not talking about the big post down the field. Sub 15 yards. So that's like seven routes in sub 15 yards that... I would say that's 80% of an NFL offense, no matter which offense, some combination of those routes. And I can show you examples of him throwing those on time, on target, you know, on pace, over and over again. It's all you want. But people don't want to concentrate that. They want to concentrate on the five-second plays where he runs around, whips at 70 yards, which is still a cool play. It's great that he's got that ability. But for some reason, the narrative became that's, that's the thing he's good at and he can't live without it. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, I mean, from my standpoint, and I've been watching him like all of us have for the last two and a half years and Heisman year, but specifically this year, once it really seemed like there was a reality that the Bears could get Caleb Williams at, with the number one pick, when you watch him this year, for me, his back shoulder throws, I think, were my favorite throws of his watching him play because we've seen Aaron Rodgers torch us with those <laughs> throws. And that takes real chemistry, a real understanding yeah. of timing and confidence to throw the ball before the receiver makes his break or turns to his back shoulder to make that throw. You have to trust that your receiver is going to be there. You have to know the spot on the field where you're going to throw it, the right depth. And he has that touch and feel and uh, understanding of timing and rhythm. And that stands out. I mean, we all understand Justin Fields limitations. And at times that was it like not, th not being able to rip it before you saw it. And he has that ability. So I'm certainly excited about that. The other thing, too, that I always would task Hogue and other people that broke down the film, I was like, break down his incompletions. Because that was the other thing. Mm -hmm. Watching him throughout the year, his incompletions, to me, at times were more impressive than his completions because I knew that they'd get lost in the history of time. Nobody knows about those throws unless you watch the game because who's breaking down tape of his incompletions, right? Everybody's just looking at the highlights and the plays that, you know, scored a touchdown. But those are the things that are encouraging to me, um, you know, about Caleb Williams. And I'm excited, um, you know, 31 days away from his name being announced and him becoming a Chicago Bear. But let's let's move on to some other things here, you know, uh, because obviously the number nine pick is now kind of at the front uh, of everyone's mind as Bears fans and what they're going to do at nine. And. You Like I said, you've been around to a few different pro days here, had a chance to see Jackson Powers Johnson in person. We all got to talk to him at the Combine. Mm -hmm. You know, he certainly has a, a bright personality. He, yes, he, he does. Uh, <laughs> you know, touched all the, the right numbers and 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 sang the right song of, of dialing up SNL and Dub Bears and hot dogs and deep dish and everything of that nature. But you were able to watch him in person. You're getting ready to go see Roma Dunze who we're all big fans of, it feels like, here in Chicago. So when you're sitting there at nine, like wh where are you looking at? Because I know Ryan Poles' comments today at the owners' meetings you know, felt like there might be a peel behind the curtain of his intentions, but still hard to say how the draft's going to fall. So where do you stand with where the Bears are going to be at at nine and where you think the draft will fall to them in that nature? Yeah, the second part of that question is a lot harder than the first part. Uh, right. Again, a lot's going to change in 31 days. A lot of people think that it's probably all locked in. As we all know, with the draft, that's not the case. Uh, in terms of where I sit for the potential landscape, and, and this is the same thing that Ryan Poles and his team are doing right now, is saying, hey, it could break this way if it does, and we're looking at these options. What are our choices? If it breaks this way and we have a different set of options, what are our choices? Which ones do we like? which are our nightmare scenarios and, and what are we going to do with all those so that they are prepared because they don't, there's a lot of variables and they don't know what's going to happen. 
there are very few players that I would be extremely comfortable sitting at nine and just picking them. And it's not necessarily because there's a lack of players who are worth that pick, but in the Bears' particular situation, there is this vast gap. They go from nine to 75. And in a lot of this, a lot of the talent in this draft is in the top 160, 170. So well more than half of it is going to just disappear while you sit there and do nothing. So if you're going to stick and pick at nine, you better be 100% blue ribbon certain that that player is a difference maker and worth wading through that chasm. One of the very few players that I would feel like I would sleep like a baby if they turn this card in is Roma Dunze. We've talked about him. I'm going to go see him on Thursday at the Pro Day. Everything about Rome, again, for the past couple of years, says this is a very good football player all the way around. And I think a lot of people forget that that's what the draft picks are for. Reminds me of the family guy skit, right? Well, here's a boat, but here's a box. Well, what could be in the box? <laughs> a boat, right? You want to get a very good player with that pick. That is a high leverage pick. And I think it is the sort of the leverage pick. I think we all assume Caleb's going to be a bear. And now what about nine? So if Rome is there, which I don't think he will be, there are scenarios where he could be there. If he's there, you run the card in and you are done. You you topped out in this draft. You got Caleb and Rome, two very good football players moving forward for the Bears. I'm okay with sitting to 75. If not, <laughs> then it gets really interesting. You better hope that somebody wants to come up. I think the nightmare scenario for the Bears is no Dunze, no neighbors, MHJ off the board. And for whatever reason, nobody wants to come up. You're sitting at nine and all three of those players are off the board. There are lots of good players. You mentioned JPJ. I think that's great. I think nine's early, especially for a center. If you look at the rookie wage scale, that's not going to give you a big boost. Same thing with Brock Bowers. I love Brock Bowers as a player. He was one of my offensive gems this year. If you draft a tight end at nine, he is one of the top five or six highest paid tight ends in the league automatically. You get no rookie wage bump because draft slots go not by position, but by slot. So it doesn't matter what position you are when you get picked number nine, you get paid the same thing. So that makes it tough to pick a tight end there. It's not that either one of those players are bad. I think they're both going to be great pros. But in terms of value, if nobody wants to come up and the three sort of receivers you want are gone, I think the Bears are kind of sweating that scenario right now. So we'll see what happens. But I would be very happy with a trade down at nine. If those three players are gone, somebody wants to come up and get whoever the second tackle, the first edge rusher potentially off the board. Like all those scenarios are great. And I think they're good for the Bears. Bears could really use to fill in that gap between nine and 75 and add another pick, most likely later on in the draft. They could use that firepower. They're sitting at four picks right now with that big gap from nine to 75. So they could use some extra picks. And if they get that opportunity, I'd I'd be okay with that. But if Rome's there, don't screw around. Turn the card in, turn him into a bear. Your opinion, EJ, Bears' biggest need is? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it was wide receiver, obviously, before Keenan. Now, Keenan's got a couple of good years left, hopefully. Certainly getting closer to the end of his career than he is to the beginning. Uh, it would be nice to put an heir apparent in there or have a third wide receiver or both this year that could really threaten defenses. So that remains a position to pick up high. It also is a very expensive position like edge rusher or quarterback, something you want to pick up high in the draft. So I would say wide receivers up there. I still think interior offensive line, but not at nine right now. If you trade back into say the twenties and JPJ is there, I would do that because like Shelton's a good answer. Shelton doesn't keep me from picking a player like JPJ. There are other centers available on down in the draft. There are other wide receivers available on down in the draft. That's cool. They need an edge, and they could use a three-tech, and there's a potential they're going to be staring at Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton at nine. It's very strong potential both players are going to be there. Not necessarily the greatest values, but again, what was Eberflus and Pohl's very first move when they came to Chicago? They signed Ogan Joby. He failed the physical. They didn't get their guy. He went to Pittsburgh, and they have been trying to catch up ever since because they – that is a very important piece of their defense. Um, maybe a little bit less so with a new DC coming over from Buffalo. Might not need that killer three tech in the same way, but you never know what Eberflus's influence is there to say, hey, we need this to we need this straw to stir the drink. 
Um, so it's a it's a weird spot. It's a very powerful spot. Still a top 10 pick, has a lot of draft capital behind it. But in terms of the way your needs have lined up based on what you've done in free agency and what you're looking to in the future, we'll see. So, okay, better scenario. They draft Roma Dunze at nine. Yeah. Or the other scenario is they trade back, I don't know, six spots. Okay. They they end up with Brock Bowers there plus you know, say say, dra- say number 54. Sure. If those two scenarios, which one would you prefer? Uh, keeping Odunze or getting Odunze Get, or going? Getting Odu- yeah, getting Odunze okay. at nine. He's there. I mean, it sounds like you would take Odunze because you said just walk it in, I, but I'm, just, I'm giving you I'm giving you the full yeah, scenario. No, I wouldn't your- be sad. Yeah, I wouldn't be sad with either because I, I love – it's funny. I only get to pick five offensive gems for the entire year, and Odunze and Bowers were two of mine. Right. So. I love and, both of those players. And you get the pick at 50. And look, common wisdom in the draft says they don't all work out. Like 30% is a very good hit rate. Less so on certain positions in the first round. So the pick at 54 is very enticing because there's a lot of good talent left on the board at 54. And you could get some very interesting players there. That's where the safeties are going to come into play. The top safeties. Um, you know, you're still going to have some good three tech options there. You're definitely going to have some great interior offensive line. You might not have your your top two centers will probably be gone. I'm almost sure JPJ and Frazier will be off the board. So just to, sort of depends on where you want to go. But, you know, two is better than one. And like Bowers is a phenomenal talent. So I would be thrilled with either. Well, the reason I asked it because I, I was listening to your show and you <laughs> could not have said nicer things about Adunze and you could not have said nicer things about Bowers. I mean, my pants came off for both of your explanations on both of them. <laughs> so it, it was there was so I was like, well, so which one if, if you could get because you wouldn't you would take Odunze over Bowers, but not but if you added another one. So that's why I asked. I mean, yeah, no, it, I think I would be thrilled either way. And and look, we've all we're all Bears fans. <laughs> we've all gone through a bunch of drafts where we've been like, ah, oh, guys, come on. What are you doing? I wouldn't say that in either one of those scenarios because if Bowers or Odunze end up as Bears, I'm like golden because you've already got Caleb. That's a very strong start to your draft. I would still like other picks. Look, I'm a draft hound. I'll take as many of them as I can get. But if you start off solid, especially at the top of the draft, and and look, like this is a reason that polls is here is that pace at the top of the draft was yeah it was pretty pretty strong in the middle of the draft but he wasn't his hit rate at the top of the draft was hit and miss and you can't afford to do that and if you come out of this draft as polls with two hits Caleb and either Odunze or Bowers at the top you know in the top in the first round your chances of being quote unquote right about that are better than average yeah, so as far as because we're getting a lot of questions about Jackson Powers Johnson here in the chat, and I think everybody's certainly intrigued by him, <clears throat> but it's going to take some maneuvering for that to become a reality. <clears throat> you talk about that gap and the Bears not picking again until 75. You know, when we stayed on Saturday, <clears throat> you know, it was almost like a, you know, a dead man walking zone for media members on Saturday. But, you know, for those of us that stuck it out, you know, for the offensive line guys, The center position certainly was intriguing to me as far as some options being available in those middle rounds where the Bears still Mm -hmm. have a couple picks. You know, the Penn State uh, center, I I thought really impressed. Yeah, he really impressed me just from an understanding of what his job is and and standpoint. So outside of Jackson Powers Johnson, for you, do do any of these centers look like a fit as a developmental par- project, now that the Bears have brought in a couple guys that can be the bridge to that potential development. Yeah, there's a lot. It's not a bad center for needing, uh, not a bad draft for needing a center. Now, again, if you hadn't brought Shelton in, that puts a lot of pressure on whoever you pick to start. And that really, to me, is just two guys, and well, maybe three guys in this draft, if you include Graham Barton. We already talked about JPJ. That would be my first. Zach Frazier, a very close second. Love Zach Frazier. I think he absolutely will start right out of the gate. And then Graham Barton from Duke, uh, you know, has played tackle, can play center, and and is a high-level athlete. He's probably going to be in the first. 40 picks for sure. Um, so those are the guys up top. After that, you are talking about, hey, you've got Shelton. Now you can put somebody behind them for when that contract runs out. You know, it's great if they have flexibility. And there's a bunch of guys. One of my favorites, uh, another one of my gems is from South Dakota State, and that's Mason McCormick. 
He is a guy that played guard for six years at South Dakota State, but he called protections as a guard, which is really interesting because he had a younger center at one point. So that's not a stretch for him. And he was snapping at the Shrine Bowl and he looked really good doing it. And I asked him, hey, do you like this? Because that's the question I ask. I don't ask, can I? Can you do it? Because it's a job interview. They're all going to say, yeah, of course I can do it. I asked, do you like it? Because some guys don't. Some guys don't like to call protections. They don't like the extra stress of doing that. They just want to stay at guard and maul people and you know, more power to them. But no, Mace lit up. He was like, no, I love it. It's cool. And he's obviously physically capable. He was, I think, the number seven guard uh, overall in RAS since like 1987 physically. Like he is, he's a beast of an athlete. Great mentality. He's down there. Um, Cedric uh, Van Pram from Georgia um, is, I think, a good option as a developmental center. I like what he can do. I wouldn't have wanted him to start right away. Same thing with Bo Limmer from Arkansas. Uh, everybody remembers him getting rolled by Tavondre Sweat at the Senior Bowl, but like when Tavondre Sweat's all wired up, he's going to roll you. Um, Bo Limmer has a lot of good tape in the SEC as a center. Uh, he followed another very good center who is currently on the commanders. So uh, I like him a lot. So there's guys. You mentioned Nor uh, Hunter Norzad from Penn State. I talked to him for like 20 minutes at Shrine Bowl before I knew who he was. He was talking to Mason and um, another guy that we'd interviewed, Christian Mahogany from Boston College. And I was mm -hmm. talking to those guys and he was just kind of the third guy. And I was like, who's this guy? And I was like, oh, that's, that's Hunter, uh, who'd been having a great week at Shrine Bowl. So I'm with you. He he definitely looks like a guy uh, that you could bring on. I don't know that he's got as much positional flexibility as some of the others. You would love a guy that could cover at guard while he's, you know, second string. Sure. Uh, but there are options and those guys are going to be, you know, Van Pram's probably in the 80s. Mason right now is in the 90s right behind him. Uh, Limmer, hmm either right above or right below that, depending on where you, who you believe about scouting reports. And then Hunter's Hunter's much farther down. You're going to be able to get him with a later pick if you pick up another one. So a uh, lot of options. Also like the kid from uh, North Carolina State, Dylan McMahon. He's a little bit undersized, but he's really good. And then uh, I was on Bill Zimmerman's podcast and brought up a guy from USC who was their starting center last year and shredded his knee in the last game of his of his college career and nobody drafted him and so he's been rehabbing all year and he was at the pro day he's a little bit understized really good move zone center great leverage but he's all healed up and everybody's forgotten about him and if Foles was smart he was like i'm i'm shaking caleb's dad's hand but i can get that guy as a udfa and, Interesting, and he's hit yeah. on UDFA's the last it, couple of years. Indeed, here. and he's an offensive lineman, so I bet he saw him because he was he was moving extremely well. It's a full year now removed from his injury. Plus, uh, you know, by the time training camp comes around, it's back to that explosion period. Uh, you know, it'll be a year and six months. So there's some options. Before we elevate you to God status on uh, the CHGO Bears podcast, <laughs> EJ, I just I I need some I need to go back in time and. You can out yourself and be honest because you seem like a sure. very honest fellow. Did you like the Valus pick? No, I right. didn't hate it. I again, like Braggs, part of what I do, part of what I've learned to do over the last 11 years in this role is not to crap on 20 year olds because they'll surprise you. Right. And that's where you should be. So uh, the old draft adage is, you know, tell me what he can do. Tell me why I want him on my team. Yes, they all have things they can't do. And you need to have that in your report, but don't lead with that, right? I used to be like, oh, I'm not I'm not in on this guy because X and X and X and X. And then they came out and improved as 20-year-olds are prone to do, just as we did. So I try and concentrate on the positive. I, you know, I tried to concentrate on the positive for Velas. There were things there. There was a path to success. It was more narrow than a bunch of other guys I liked that were on the board. So I didn't crap on the pick, but it was not my favorite. And, you know, the Bears make some picks like that, where uh, last year when they picked the two defensive tackles, I really liked Javon Dexter. I I wasn't wild about the other one. I was, yeah. And I said so at the time. I was like, well, you know, again, there is a path to him being successful. I see Javon's path much more clearly. Right. And this isn't an exact science, and you're not going to be no. perfect, and neither is Ryan Poles. And no. did you like the Tyler Scott pick? No, I mean, I understood it for where they got him. And again, a very yeah. Tyler Scott is like a needle, right? As some guys are, you know, they have the whole circle of the Venn diagram. Some guys are a big slice of the pie. Tyler Scott is a needle. Like he has one role. 
is a speed guy from slot. Like that's it. That's what he's going to do. He's, he tries hard as a blocker. There was some, you know, funny clips that came out like a month ago <laughs> talking about some of the things he was asked to do in the bears offense. Yeah. Like good on him. He's, he seems like a good dude. He's obviously a tremendous athlete, but like his role was always this. And I, those players, again, unless they develop like Mooney did to really widen out and show that they could do quite a bit more when they're on the field, like as a defense, you don't worry about that guy. Right. Because it's like, I know what he's doing. He's either trying to run my safety off or I'm not really worried about him because my nickelback's going to run through him. Like if I have a good nickelback, he's going to run through him. He's going to get in the way, maybe on the block, but I'm not, I'm not accounting for, Oh, we got to watch out for where Tyler Scott is on that sweep. Like, the defense knows like he's going deep either as a decoy or they're going to take a shot. That's it. That's, that's what he's doing. And he, I'm not saying Tyler can't, can't develop, but when he picked him, I was like, and they picked him down the board. It wasn't like they spent a high pick on him, but I was like, again, there were more well-rounded players that I liked that were still on the board. Was Puka Nakua one of them? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> oh man. I was a huge, EJ, man. Let's no, I was a huge Puka stan. And this is, the reason this happened is he was at UW. He started at UW. And whenever he played at UW, he killed it. He crushed. And then he'd get hurt. And so coaching staff got tired of that. I mean, we've all seen coaching staff say, hey, and he transferred. He went to BYU. And he lit it up. And he got hurt. <laughs> and then he came back. And he lit it up. And he went to the senior bowl. And he got hurt. <laughs> Like every time he was healthy and on the field, he was amazing. And I said to people starting last June, now this is the cool thing about having a podcast where you do one every week is you can go back to our pre-draft episodes. You can go back to our post-draft episodes where we talk about the Rams. And I said, if I had three wishes from an NFL genie this year, I would use one wish to keep Puka healthy, not to make him great, not to anything else, just keep him healthy and see what happens. And he was healthy all year. And what happened? And, you know, it was so obvious to see when that guy's on the field and healthy, he was a wrecker. He was so good, but he just couldn't stay healthy. That's good stuff. Well, I, I feel like the reason Mark might be asking some of those questions is the confidence level. Because when you talk about trading back and potentially taking a wide receiver in the second round, there's a lot of good wide receivers available. But with Roma Dunze, yeah, you don't get those extra picks but you have a better shot at this guy working out where but you get Roma Dunze. <laughs> right, exactly. Because, Which is a really good thing. Right, because, right. you know, with Ryan Poles, you know, swing and miss with Bayless Jones, Chase Claypool trading for him, swing and miss, you know, book's not out on Tyler Scott by any means, but not exactly, you know, what we're looking for to complete sure. that room out. So I think that's maybe what All right, I'll give you alluding to is, is finding is the polls that, that polls can get to later that I think are going to be really good. Ricky Pearsall from Florida. I'm extremely high on him. He's going to be a second rounder. You're going to have to spend, you're going to have to find a way to get him. He's going to be before 75. He's probably going to be in the late fifties, early sixties, but there's a receiver. I think he's going to be really good and farther on down the board, sitting at like unexplicably, inexplicably at like 120 on most boards right now is Malik Washington from UVA. Go get Malik Washington. Go cats guy was guy was he led the ACC in receiving and that's you know same conference as Johnny Wilson Keon Coleman Bub means like all the guys that are getting hyped you don't hear Malik's name very much he crushed his pro day two days ago like that is a guy you could throw in the slot as a number three right now be productive right off the bat Caleb would love him oh just just a little hat tip Taj Washington from USC Caleb's receiver. Yep. He's he's currently sitting at about 155. We interviewed him at Shrine Bowl. If he's there, navy and orange, baby. Who, who's the who's the uh, receiver that once was a quarterback that um he had an I think he had a knee issue. He lost both his parents. You guys talked about him on the pod. Oh, so Xavier Leggett. Yeah. What do we think about that? I I love Leggett. He's not going to be a bear unless they trade up. Like he's not He's not okay. making it to 75. Like okay. he's, he's awesome. I love him. He's yeah. really cool. But I, it, just like Pearsall, unless you trade up, you're not, 
you're not probably getting him. I don't think either one of those guys makes it to 75. And again, trade ups are really fraught when you've only got four picks. But, you know, those are two guys down the board that if you're not going to pick a wide receiver in the first, if you're going to say trade back and again, get that pick, like you said, in the mid 50s, I would be perfectly happy with them spending whatever you said, 54, 55 on Ricky Pearsall. That'd be great. Yeah, I'm Scottish Bear here in the chat saying, Braggs has hardly said a word in 40 minutes, and uh, that's what happens when EJ is on. You listen. That's right. I think all of us here appreciate EJ's you know, knowledge here, and, and we're all learning something about this upcoming draft, and it's exciting to learn this stuff and, and hear it from somebody that has been in the trenches. You were on the field at the Combine watching these guys do their testing. You've been at the Pro Days. You're going to continue to do that. You're at the Shrine Bowl. Uh, so it's great to get that firsthand perspective from somebody that, you know, is a big part of a staple of Bears Twitter, but on to bigger and better things and somebody we can trust to give this kind of analysis. So uh, I, I had told EJ before the show, I was like, we'll do 30 minutes with you, but we're going to keep it rolling, EJ, if you don't mind for a solid. I'm good. I told you I had 60, so you yeah. get them all. So I'm going to give it to you because we did have some um, questions from the chat. And I know so many people are excited to hear your perspective. So I'm going to cut Carm loose here. He's got to get to the Bulls you game. Are. Yeah, I'm cutting you <laughs> loose here, Carm, because I know you're trying to get to the Bulls game. So I appreciate you coming on here. I, I'm good, buddy. But OK, I'll let you guys handle it because you're if you're under control, that's cool. Hey, EJ, um, thanks so much for doing this. Um, and I really enjoyed your pod today. So um, it was a great afternoon just listening to you guys. So well, uh, I, I appreciate you listening and I appreciate the chance to come on both. Yeah, yeah Con of course. Continued success. Anything. Uh, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I'm, well, I would just like to put out the contention that I, 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 I've been here for the first 40 minutes. I heard a lot of words from Greg Bergs. I heard like 7,000 <laughs> words from Greg Bergs. So I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I could have used more, more EJ in my first. Yeah, well, less words for Carm there. See you later, Carm. That's how it works. That's how it works, EJ, when you're the. You got the, the producer's team, man. Ship. Oh, uh, exactly, the right. exactly right. So uh, before we get into the back half here, as we round third here on CHO Bears After Dark, I did want to give a shout out here to Circa Sports. Um, they, they've been such great partners with us. We were over at their uh, sports book in Waukegan. It was a lot of fun last week. Uh, so make sure you're hitting up Circa Sports Book, tight money line splits. Uh, games strive to be a minus 110 split on the circus sports menu, unlike other sports books, which may use a minus 115 or minus 120 split. Circus Sports keeps as little money as possible on large market bets, especially compared to the other books. Circus Sports does not limit players based on their winnings. Every player has the same limits, unlike other books who do limit winning players. We encourage bettors to download and explore all sports betting apps available and go compare the lines for yourself. Download them, find out for yourself. Nobody's better than Circus Sports. Real people behind the Circus Sports brand who resolve issues in a timely fashion, unlike other books who use the chatbots, their customer service is second to none. All aspects of the app are being run by the same team that runs the main Circus Sports book at Circa Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. So download the Circus Sports Illinois app at circusportscom slash Illinois dash app to sign up today. Also be on the lookout for Circa events watch parties, and tailgates. If you or someone you may know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER or text GAMB to 833-234 or, really, or visit areyoureallywinning.com. And one of the events that we do have coming up in 31 days uh, will be our draft party at Joe's on Weed Street presented by Circus Sports uh, set from 7 to 10 p.m. on Thursday night, night one of the draft. The first round will be live. Uh, after party afterwards with my guy, DJ Trey tunes going to be a lot of fun. We were at Joe's on wheat street last year. Tickets are available. This is presented by Circa and Casa Azul, uh, tequila and spirits. So make sure you're hitting those guys up. Uh, we really appreciate their partnership, but, uh, tickets are available at all chgo.com slash events. Uh, and then on the second night, we're running it back to back two nights again, just like last year, have a chance to meet Gary Fensick presented by the collector's cave. Uh, we really appreciate those guys. So live shows on Thursday and Friday night for the first, second, and third round. And then Dalton and the Sheriffs uh, are going to be live for the after party on Friday night. So we'll be keeping the party rolling. And if you become a diehard, you can get a discount on that event. You get a free shirt right out the gate and all the exclusive content that we have here at allchgo.com and chgo sports, including the Bears 100 draft guide. 
uh, which now that EJ's helped with some knowledge, maybe I can start putting some input to. I know uh, <laughs> Hogue and Nick are doing a lot of hard work with that. And then, um, of course, you know, uh, Adam Hogue's newsletter, which is weekly. So a lot of different things for you guys to have at your disposal here at CHGO Sports. Okay. Um, really appreciate your time here tonight, EJ. It's always a pleasure talking with you. You're one of the good guys here in our, you know, you know, in this industry and, and somebody I root for in a big way. And it's cool to see your success here going forward. We did have a super chat from young Drizzy, but he didn't have a comment. So if you did have one, put it in the comment section, Drizzy, and I'll be sure to get to it, but we appreciate your super chat here tonight, but let's get through some of these questions. Um, Clayton Stoker also with a $10 super chat saying with Atlanta giving Mooney the bag and JF one value from the league was so low. Is there a chance polls wants to evaluate Braxton and young wide receivers under Caleb before spending number nine on either position? Ooh, good question. I don't think the bears right now are thinking that they're going to spend a high pick on tackle. I believe they believe in Braxton. I believe that's the right call. I believe he's played well enough to do that. Again, you have a very limited number of picks and you already have, you know, a pretty good player there. Let's not make a hole where there's not one. Um, young wide receivers. I think in that case, they're going to do everything they can to give Caleb as many targets as they can so that they are not, affected by an injury or limited in that way. They just don't want, they want as few possible excuses to not see what Caleb can do. And that includes tackle, but I think that probably means more backup tackle mid rounds guy with some flexibility, maybe Roger Rosengarten out of UW or Dominic Pooney out of Kansas who can play tackle or guard, somebody like that. It's down the board right around a hundred, you know, uh, overall that could be a good third swing tackle. So again, that if either one of your starting tackles who are young and talented go down, that the whole thing doesn't go in the can. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, it'll be interesting. Cause I, I did feel like leaving the combine. I'm like, man, they might have to take a tackle here, you know? Uh, yeah. It, it, and they're like, good choices. And there right. will be, the world is pretty much going to be their oyster at nine for tackle. I imagine Joel to be off the board, but that it, a lot of people were surprised that they were out in force at the OSU Pro Day. There's really no reason to be at the OSU Pro Day except for Talisi Puaga, who is a very good tackle. He's a right tackle. Um, and they left immediately after his workout. I mean, they were in town, obviously, to see organs. It's right up the road. It's the next day. It's only, you know, 45 miles away. Like, you definitely come for both. But they came to OSU, and there was no other reason for them to be there. And there were seven of them there. They were the only head coach in attendance. Uh, their offensive line coach ran the drills along with the offensive line coaches from two of the teams. Like it, people were really surprised when I said, Hey, Fluce is here. People were like, what? And I was like, you know, it's just due diligence, but yeah, yeah. they're looking at all the tactics. Well, well, he, he fits the mold of nastiness with like yeah. Darnell Wright. Oh, had, great you know, so, um, you know, if, and, and Hogue has him as the top tackle on the board even mm. over Joe all, which I find interesting. I'd probably have all over, but I'm also no draft analyst, uh, yeah. but I'm also a Notre Dame football guy. Uh, Matthew Brown saying how excited would EJ be if we drafted Mason McCormick at 75, if he got there, I mean, you touched on this here a little bit earlier, yeah. um, but I'd you know. be thrilled. I, I know Mason. Uh, I've talked to him multiple times. I, I text with him every once in a while and his tackle Garrett Greenfield, who's also in this draft. Uh, we interviewed them together. That interview will be coming out on bootleg. It's a great one. It's the first one we've ever done with two players uh, from the same team at the same time. Uh, and we figured, Hey, it's a garden, a tackle. They've played together for like five years. This could be really cool. If we get both of their perspectives on how they saw stuff. Um, those guys are great. That team was completely loaded. Both of their wide receivers are going to get drafted. The running backs are going to get drafted. The tight ends probably going to get drafted. The left tackle and the left guard are getting drafted. And the center is going to get drafted, but not this year. So there's like seven guys on that offense that are going to be in the NFL, which is which is kind of crazy. But I, I love Mace. He has the right football makeup. He is. I didn't know he was that good an athlete. Like, I honestly was surprised by his combine numbers. I thought he was going to be good, but not like elite. Right. Um and just from a mental makeup standpoint, quick story, uh, he had a guy get up in his grill like second or third day of Shrine practice, you know, face mask to face mask, chest bump, the whole bit. And I was at a place where I could see Mason's face during that interaction. I was like, oh, look at this, uh, a little scrap. This is interesting. And Mason was just smiling the whole time. And so I saw him later that night at the hotel and I said, hey, because we'd interviewed him a couple of days before. And so I already knew him. And I said, hey, 
that guy, he was using your business today. And he was like, mm -hmm. and I was like, you seemed, uh, you seemed pretty calm about it. And he was like, if he wants to go there. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, oh, he's the quiet one. He's the one you got to worry say, the about. The quiet ones are the ones you got to worry he's about. He's the one you got to worry about. No, I love Mace. If he ended up in Navy and Orange, I'd be thrilled. I think he'd be a fan favorite. Uh, he's just, he's such a good dude. He is such an offensive lineman. And I say that in the highest possible regard. He is so, so committed to his craft and he's really good at it. Yeah, um, the quiet ones are definitely the ones you got to worry about. Not loud mouths like me that are all bark and no bite. I, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a softy. Don't let it fool you. Drew Black here asking, EJ, what are your thoughts on Olu at nine? Feels like his name doesn't come up enough as it should be, at least to Drew. And it does feel like Olu is like, like it felt like, you know, last year yeah. and leading into this year, he was like the top tackle. And Correct. as this year has gone on and now we're into the off season, it, it does feel like his name is dropping. Do you feel like that is the case? I, I, I feel that drew, I understand where you're coming from is that it was just, so it was at the top of every list. Olu was the first offensive lineman, forget tackle that anybody talk about. Whoa, Olu's coming. Olu's coming. Olu's coming. Still a great player. Really, really good in pass protection. Extremely athletic. Great frame. Exactly what you want in the modern NFL. Some people are a little bit down on his run blocking, but I don't mean down. I just mean, yeah. It's gotten real quiet. I don't think it needs to. I haven't heard any reason why it should, you know, combine medicals or anything off the field. Again, I don't always hear that stuff, but there hasn't been any reason for that sort of quieting, that sort of disappearance. He's a very good player. I don't think the Bears, again, need to go tackle any tackle up high. Um, if Olu ended up as a Bear, I think they would have a very good pass protecting left tackle. I think they already do in Braxton, but Olu is, you know, maybe a cut above and you would have, again, three good young tackles. That's nice. I think it may be uh, a little bit of sort of padding the coffers where you already have a bunch of money. <laughs> so, yeah. but great player. Yep. And yeah, it's definitely his, his shine has definitely dulled a bit and I'm not sure why. Well, and if you trade back to 12 or 15 and then you take, you know, Caleb Williams, former high school teammate, uh, you know, that's, that's not half bad, especially the pedigree of talent that he's bringing, uh, DBB here in the chat, $5 super chat. We appreciate your support. What are your thoughts on Tanner Bordellini as a developmental mm -hmm. center? Also, where do you think he comes off the board? Uh, that's a good question. He comes off the board higher than he would have before the combine. The reason I like Tanner a lot is his measurements are elite. Um, they are excellent in terms of his movement skills. And he's one of the few guys in this draft that has played all five O line positions. So he is, I think better as an interior player, but he is, you know, we've seen guys right up the road that play for that other team that can play five positions and man, are they handy? Um, Tanner's a very good athlete. I would probably say any pick after about 200 in this draft, you just start looking for him to come off pretty soon because he's versatile. He's flexible. He's a very good athlete. He's experienced. He went to Wisconsin. He understands how to block. Um, you know, I, I like his potential there and man, again, there's only 53 guys on the roster. The more you can do. And a guy like Tanner Bordellini is maybe worth a spot and a half because he could play center. He could play guard. You could maybe play tackle in a pinch. Right. But, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, versatility is definitely key. You know, um, it helps you, you know, stay on the football field. So with that being said, Dr. Truth, who's always in our chat, we appreciate truth. He says, can you ask EJ if, if Jackson powers Johnson might be a challenge because he's a bigger center and might not be the best center for the bears zone rushing scheme <laughs> since we'd prefer a mobile center. You're laughing. Oh, I am laughing. Um, watch a little JPJ tape. <laughs> He is fast as hell at that size. It's ridiculous. He is faster than some much smaller centers in this draft. Like he is faster than guys. He outweighs by like 30 pounds. He is a redonkulous athlete and he loves burying defensive backs on the corner. And he's agile enough to do it at 330, which is bonkers. Like that's why everybody's talking about him. He's extremely young. He's a true junior. Um, we wouldn't have even seen him at the senior bowl prior to this year because juniors weren't eligible. That's a rule change. So that's the whole reason he ended up in mobile this year, but go watch some ducks tape. I I'm, I'm guessing you're either a Midwestern or an East coast fan. Didn't catch a lot of ducks tape because it was on later. He right. is stupid mobile at that size. He is incredible. He's an incredible athlete. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I won't be upset, but then I guess my question is with JPJ, 
Cause I have heard some people say, you think he'll stay at center? Or do you think being drafted so high that somebody might want him as a guard? Well, I think you could play him as a guard because you brought in a center. Now, you know, I was, I have been a outspoken proponent of getting a center because we needed one for two years. Really thought they were going to draft one last year. They didn't, but they went out and got Coleman Shelton. That's, that's good enough. That is a professional center that can be in the middle of your line and stabilize it. So if you, if either one of your now projected starting guards gets hurt, which they both spent time on the bench last year, uh, you could put JPJ in at guard and it would be a plus, not a minus. He is going to be able to move people. He's going to be able to anchor against all those monsters. Like he has the physical skills to do that right now. And then you don't want to resign Shelton or Shelton gets hurt. Like that's the thing is like, it's a 17 game season. There's a lot of injuries. If you end up sliding JPJ over to center for any reason in his rookie season, he's never leaving. He's going to be, he's going to man the pivot for the next like seven, eight years. Hell yeah. Hey, that's great. Um, I'm definitely intrigued by that. We've got a couple more minutes here and then we're going to wrap things up. This has been a phenomenal uh, episode of bears after dark. We'll, we'll be back next week. Um, well, um, he's, he had some things to do here tonight. So, Sorry, EJ didn't get to you know hang out with it's Corey. All right. You had to deal I'll, with I'll meet Corey. I, I like yeah. watching him play. I, yeah, I, I can pull up my scouting report from Corey. That'd be fun. <laughs> hey, next I like that. Next time you come on, we'll pull up his scouting report. All right, I'll have to. I'll have and to if see. it's bad, that's even better because he's always busting my balls about something, so we can mess with him a little bit. Oh, uh, sure. He 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 can take a good joke, so we'll mess with him here. Uh, so a few more, and then we'll wrap things up. We appreciate all your time. Please hit that like button. Everybody here in the chat, we appreciate everybody hanging out. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, Illinois Jones here in the chat is asking, EJ, how much does next year's draft potential waver into this draft based on red? Uh, well, I'm not sure what the right question is. I like, just read the comments, have no yeah, idea why he added the red, yeah, but I read it your, because I'm like Ron yeah. Burgundy. <laughs> Yeah, no. How much do you want to borrow from next year for this year? Um, if you are, I, I will say this about this year's draft. And, um, you know, the Bears are in this position, but not really because they're at 1 1 overall. So they can take whoever they want. If you are a team that needs a quarterback that is maybe outside the range of where you think you can get a starter, you're probably going to do some things that are a little bit sillier this year because next year's class looks real thin right now. There's a couple guys up top. There's always some guy that rises up the boards. And after that, like there's going to be two and a half quarterbacks coming out next year, maybe. And that's rugged because there's always a need for quarterbacks. So that's one particular way where teams are looking at next year's crop of draft hopefuls and going, oh man, like sell the farm. We need to do it this year. We need to go up and get our guy because if we don't get him this year, we might not get one next year either. And that's, that's a long stretch. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So yeah, I, as we wrap things up here, it'll be interesting to see what the bears do at nine. I'm kind of of the belief that as much as I understand trading back and adding more picks, I'm not going to complain. I think they're in a great spot, whether mm -hmm. they take a wide receiver, take a tackle or trade back and add more value into this draft. Um, I think this might be one of the, I'm hoping this is one of their last chances to have a top 10 pick and they have two and you're taking quarterback with one. So when you're talking about, you know, premier players, you know, yep. the, the blue chip players, this might be their last chance to take one. So they might just have to bite the bullet polls reference the amount of draft picks they've had over the last three years. They have a ton of draft picks coming next year, especially if Ian Cunningham were to get a GM job as well, that adds to that pot that they already have. So I almost feel like they kind of just have to take somebody, even a pass rusher, which we didn't really talk too much here uh, tonight. Uh, it's all about offense, but uh, understandably so they have to build you know, this environment to make this work final thoughts. And then we'll cut you loose. We talk so much about personnel, but the, de the development is so key Yeah, for coaching. How confident are you that Shane Waldron, Kerry Joseph, Thomas Brown, and this coaching staff can get the most out of Caleb Williams? I'm, I have a, a solid amount of confidence. I feel I've told a bunch of people in the last couple of weeks that this is the best, you know, uh, I don't want to make a bird reference, but like this is the best nest <laughs> that the Chicago bears have created for a young quarterback in some time. And Caleb is coming into a better situation with fewer holes, even before the draft. Hopefully it will be even better after the draft. Again, 
he has what he needs. I talked about that at the top of the show, but he also has what he needs from a personnel standpoint. And that was really what killed like Justin's year along with some very, what I'll call triple P piss poor planning. Like they just didn't, they didn't account for who Justin was and he didn't have the town around. Now there was a reason for that. Polls came in and he had to clear the cap. He did what was not popular, but necessary to put the bears in the position they're in now. However, he is using that money, filling those holes, the things like Montez Sweat. I know that's on defense, but it makes a big difference. You don't want to get boat raced every week. And Keenan say, no, we are making this a very solid landing spot for a young quarterback. If he's good enough, then you add the coaching on top. They too have the best chance to succeed. Because again, we saw Getsy dial up some good stuff. Receivers outside of DJ, for the most part, were creating separation regularly you can talk about how justin didn't throw some stuff that was there that's true too like it all sort of spirals together now you got keenan and dj you're gonna have better protection on the offensive line and if shane waldron's even average and he was that in seattle i got to see that up close last year caleb's got a good solid chance to start off and not, just not start off behind the eight ball like and so many bears quarterbacks in recent history have done that so yeah well it's going to be exciting to see this process play itself out here at mini camp and training camp and then as we get into the season um you know victor garcia says in the chat ej tell brett i said hi i hope brett is ready to jump on the bears bandwagon with caleb coming uh well and if you he watch he's excited yeah. he's excited about it but he's got his own bandwagon because he's a he's a texans fan and he's back on now that they've got cj he's He's happy to be on that side, but he's also, he's happy for all of us. He's, he likes Chicago. It's his second team. His dad worked in both cities when he was growing up. So he, those are his two fandoms, but he knows, he knows what it means to have a quarterback in Chicago and, and just haven't for a very well, long time. Hopefully the Texans and bears meet up in a super bowl and that'll be the ultimate bootleg football <laughs> podcast. Uh, it will be. Yeah, will be. Anything you want to let us know. I know you're going to Washington's pro day coming up, but anything you want to let us know what you're working on here coming up, whether it's, with yeah, City, uh, or bootleg. Yeah. Well, bootlegs got a great slate. We've got Mina and DJ and Matt Harmon and Emery and Matt Bowen, and they're all coming. So we're going to, we're going to be cranking those episodes out over the next couple of weeks. Let's go. And then they will be, they will be coming out before draft time. We're going to keep releasing interviews from the shrine bowl. We've got three more of those of the editors right now. Um, those are great. Some of those I referenced in this episode and then, yeah, we'll be doing our draft live stream. This is the fifth year, which is crazy because it was one of the first things we did when we found a bootleg kind of by accident. And uh, Brett reminded me when I was down in L.A. that this is year five of every single pick. Um, so we'll be doing that. I'll be heading down to L.A. for that. And then uh, then maybe sleeping. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> well, we'll see. Every time we think we're about to get a break, more things pop <laughs> off here. Never That's a dull right. moment with the Chicago Bears and the National Football League, which never takes a day off. Um, hey, we went. Four minutes over, so that means I owe you a few beers and, and a pizza or some lunches on me next time you're in town. EJ, it's been a pleasure talking football with you, and I look forward to seeing you soon or maybe at a training camp near you here uh, as we get to the season. Or, you know, who knows? Maybe at the Hall of Fame game because mm, I might be there. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, I definitely am going because I have to gravel at the – throne that is the great Devin Hester. So, uh, all right. Well, that wraps things up for tonight. Thank you once again to EJ Snyder from bootleg football, doing such a great job and also senior draft analyst at the Windy City Gridiron. Thank you to everybody in the chat and Mark Carmen for toughing it out here before he head over to the, the Bulls game. If you see him throw some popcorn on his head, like Benny, the bull would other than that, we'll be back tomorrow at noon. Kevin Warren speaking at the owner's meeting tomorrow morning. So Adam Hogue will be there to cover it all and we'll be there to react to it at 12 p.m. Central in studio uh, with Mark Carmen and myself, Adam Hogue, as well. So, uh, everyone, have a good night. Thank you to everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you tomorrow. And always, bear down. We all silly like the mayor. 